Good afternoon. My name is Edward Hughes. I'm the president of the HBS Club of San Diego. I'm delighted you're joining us today. Uh, before I introduce our, our speaker, I have uh, just a few slides I'd like to uh, to share with you. I'll bring those up. All right. So again, uh, Edward Hughes, HBS Club of San Diego. Uh, thank you for joining us. I appreciate our sponsors, Hughes Marino, KPMG, Latham Watkins, uh, and the Honor Foundation. So uh, we are delighted to have HBS Club members, and then we have a lot of guests as well, which is fantastic because the topic today is obviously very interesting and very pertinent to a lot of businesses. Uh, our mission as a club is to continue to educate leaders who make a difference in the world and make San Diego a great place to live and work. Uh, and we do that through a number of kind of core initiatives. Uh, most of you hopefully uh, recently received this newsletter, um, which is about a 12, 14 page uh, newsletter that, letter that covers a lot of the stuff that we do as a club, uh, because there's a lot of things that go on during the year. So uh, that newsletter is, link is still available on our website. If you've got interest, please take a look. But it's pretty comprehensive in terms of the, the, the types of things we do, our mission and the types of impact that we have. Uh, but let me cover a couple of them. Uh, firstly, in our core programming is our CEO forum, and this is what we're doing today, uh, where we invite distinguished guests to talk about you know, great topics that we think are going to be interesting to our, our club members. Uh, last year, we had a great lineup, uh, and we kind of operate on an academic year, so now this is really the first one of this year, uh, so we're just kicking off today. Uh, but you can see we had Stone Brewing, we had CEO of Callaway Golf, we had Cirrus Aircraft, uh, David uh, spoke to us last year. We've been doing a series with David because obviously since COVID, a lot of stuff's been changing, uh, and so we want to kind of get regular updates. We had an HBS professor, we had Sandra Curl from San Diego Water Authority, Karen Burns from San Diego Community Power, and Jason Tushin, who's running a company, but we talked a lot about leadership, and uh, he was a former Navy SEAL for uh, 26 years, a very distinguished guy, so a lot of very interesting things uh, in that topic. Uh, our lineup for the fall, uh, and that's what we've published so far. Obviously, today we've got David Marino uh, from Hughes Marino. Uh, we have Professor Reg, uh, Meg Rithmeyer, and she's going to be talking about China uh, and how to deal with China in the new economic era. Uh, we have our global networking night coming up on the uh, 25th. Uh, more details will be coming out about that. Uh, David Abelis, who is the CEO of TaylorMade Golf, and talking about that, that company has gone through a number of changes and, and some very interesting dynamics going on there. Uh, Aaron Soslansky, who is the CEO of Flock Freight on December 14th, and then we have our holiday party on the uh, 16th. So uh, nice schedule for the fall. Second thing we do is uh, management development programs. Uh, I have to say, unfortunately, this year, I think probably because of the state of the economy, uh, we had to cancel this year's for-profit uh, management development program. I think a lot of big companies are going through transitions, layoffs, and, and they are the core of the, the uh, group or our customers uh, that send uh, people to participate in that. So, uh, so that's a little disappointing, uh, but we are going to be doing a not-for-profit program uh, in the spring, uh, and then we hope to bring back the for-profit management development program uh, in the fall of next year. Social enterprise, uh, that's a big deal to the club. Uh, as you heard in our mission statement, part of it is making San Diego a great place to live and work. Uh, and we do that by a number of different things. Uh, this is a little snippet out of that newsletter, but basically we try to make an impact. Uh, each year, uh, we donate a fairly significant amount of money uh, to local nonprofits. And we also uh, spend a lot of money educating local nonprofit leaders. Uh, cumulatively, we're about $550,000 now that we've invested in, in the local uh, social nonprofits, uh, non social enterprise here in San Diego. Uh, and we think it's making a difference. We think that management education is key uh, in that if we can teach or at least get HBS to teach uh, the local nonprofit leaders how to think about their organizations and strategy uh, and execution, uh, then hopefully we can have a much bigger impact. Uh, over the last 18 years, we've had the chance to send 44 recipients, uh, all either executive directors or local uh, CEOs, back to uh, HBS. Uh, this year, our honorees were John Van Cleef, the CEO of Community Resource Center, Todd Tibbetts, uh, President and CEO of YMCA of San Diego County, and Drew Moser, the Executive Director of the Lucky Duck Foundation. Uh, three great guys. Uh, we had uh, a great send-off for them. They gave us fantastic feedback on the program, and we're going to be getting together in the next month uh, to talk about how we can coordinate amongst some of these nonprofits to see if there's a, a bigger impact that we can have. 
Second thing we do, as I say, is we have a local nonprofit program. Uh, you'll be starting to see the marketing for that in about another month or so. Uh, if you are connected to a local nonprofit, you know, forward that on. Uh, the people get a fantastic experience. Uh, it's uh, 14 cases over seven uh, Monday evenings, uh, all HBS cases uh, taught by obviously members of the club. Right. And last year we had record uh, attendees to that. So, again, you know, we're trying to get some management education. Then we think that's going to make a big difference uh, for these organizations. And the final thing is our social networking. And this year, one of the things the board has, has kind of asked us to, all to do is try and figure out how we get back together more often. Uh, I think uh, many of us are missing networking um, and so trying to get out and do more of those things. So, so we have a blend of stuff. We have the holiday party, as I mentioned, coming up on December 16th. Uh, we are going to start doing a quarterly happy hour uh, starting in January. Uh, we're looking to do a panel about space. Obviously, there's a great uh, amount of activity going on in space, and that's going to be hosted by the CEO. CEO of San Diego Air and Space Museum. We'll do that at the museum. And then we're looking to do a San Diego innovation panel. So those dates will be uh, coming out uh, shortly. Today's format is a webinar format. Uh, and so you'll see uh, David and myself. Uh, David's going to uh, share some thoughts, share some slides, uh, and then we'll go into some Q&A. Uh, as you have questions, feel free to pop them into the chat straight away. Uh, I can go back and David says it's fine for me to interrupt him and go back and ask you know, more about the details of that, right? Or I can just get them at the end. So, but please, you know, feel free to do that. We do the webinar format because we have a lot of people on uh, and sometimes people don't turn their mics off and it can be uh, kind of distracting. So, so let me uh, stop sharing and introduce our guest. Uh, so many of you know David. Um, you know, David is the co-founder and senior executive vice president of Hughes Marino, the largest tent representation company in San Diego and growing nationally every time I talk to him, he's opening new offices, uh, which is fantastic. He's committed to only representing tennis. Um, so he has obviously that, that perspective. Uh, whether it's lease or purchase type transactions. Uh, he does a lot of high value, time critical type, complex transactions. I've known David for a long time and he's, he's done a lot of amazing deals in technology, life science, uh, business service companies. Uh, he's obviously got years of expertise in the uh, commercial real estate. Uh, he's represented uh, over, done over 3000 transactions and done over 20 million square feet. So when I asked David to come back and talk to us again, because you know this is obviously a very dynamic market, I said, you know, what do you want the topic to be? He said, the baddest state of the commercial real estate market, the ongoing office free fall, followed by a life science meltdown and questions around the, the industrial sector. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty interesting set of uh, topics to talk about. So David, uh, welcome again. Always, always great to have you on. Yeah, thanks, Edward. Pleasure to be here for kind of this annual update. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am and, and what our firm is, I, I just want to give a little background. So I have been in commercial real estate for 34 years now here in San Diego and uh, got my graduate business school uh, degree at the uh, esteemed University of Southern California. Um, and then uh, came down here initially in 1989 to get into real estate development on the office and life science side, also with an industrial property sector of Trammell Crow Company, which at the time was the biggest landlord in the United States. And so I kind of cut my teeth being an owner and, you know, survived the meltdown of the early 90s, where we had this uh, overinvested, overbuilt, bloated commercial real estate asset class that collapsed. Uh, you know, basically every office building in downtown San Diego was foreclosed upon from 1991 to 1995, with one exception. Uh, it was an absolute meltdown. Uh, you know, what worked through the, the 2000 tech wreck and the 07 financial crisis and now this, right? Um, but I do work in life science, headquarters office and regional office work and industrial manufacturing distribution, and I, and I work nationally for clients. So um, I cover all the product types and do work all over the country, um, you know, with a key foothold here, obviously. So we're going to be very national, but we're going to drill into what's going on in San Diego and all of these product types. Um, but Hughes Marino as a company, this idea of representing tenants we're really this white hat in the process. We don't have an agenda. You know, we don't represent landlords. We don't provide any services to building owners. So we're, there's no conflicts of interest. There's no steering. There's no landlord as the customer to upset by being aggressive for a tenant. And, and while we represent tenants, we're, we're just calling balls and strikes, right? We're calling it as we see it and as we think it's coming at us. Because our clients, you know, those of you on the, the call here running companies, owning companies that are executives, 
entrepreneurs, you, you need to know what's really going on, right? Like how bad is it really? Um, and, and let me talk about that for a second in the office sector. So, you know, we're now three and a half years post COVID. The reality is that companies have settled into a new normal and, and you sort of have this normal curve where the number of companies coming back five days a week is beyond the second standard deviation, right? It's really out there. There's a whole bunch of companies that have already gone remote and they're kind of off the field already, right? They've already gone remote. There, there are really not that many more companies now that think it's a good idea to go remote. Those who've done it are doing it and sort of sticking with it. Some are starting to kind of think about coming back, but the, the bulk of the market are kind of in the middle in this sort of hybrid model which you're reading a lot about. And so all this noise about big companies getting people back, it's getting people back two or three days a week. It is not getting people back full time with, with maybe a few exceptions. But the drum beat around corporate America is get people back, but they're not coming back five days a week. It's never gonna happen, okay? And what's strange is that some companies have formalized this policy and some today are kind of a free for all, sort of this unstructured, uh, let the people do what they will as long as they're productive. I was just at lunch yesterday with the CEO and CFO of a public company called BioLays in Orange County. And they said, yeah, you know, everybody's doing their thing and some people are in and the outside salespeople aren't and the marketing people are in once in a while. And I said, well, do you have a formal policy? They said, no, we just kind of let people do what they want. And, and that seems to be more often the case, as strange as it is. There is, there is no policy. That the policy is not to have a policy. And, and try to make anybody do anything. Um, you know, we're more formalized. We're four days a week other than Fridays, and it's working well for us. I do believe that those companies who get most of the people back most of the time will outperform their competition. I found, I found out, foundationally believe that. Um, but what's happening around the country is, and in San Diego, is you've got about 40% of all the office leases that have expired since COVID. Okay, so roughly 60% of all leases that were signed pre-COVID had yet to expire. You know, those five to seven to 10 year office deals that were signed back in, you know, 2019, 2018. Well, those things still all have a bunch of term on them, right? And as, as I'm out there walking around, meeting with CEOs, touring spaces, literally hundreds a year, and my team of 170 people around the country are touring through spaces, you see a lot of empty space, okay? There's a lot of people paying a lot of rent on a lot of empty offices and workstations. And that, that is the new normal. And so when those lease contracts expire, guess what's happening? That net space is coming back to market. We call that negative net absorption. So when a company moves from 30,000 down to 20,000, that's 10,000 square feet of negative net absorption. And I've been saying since 2020, when I saw this coming, that this will be death by a thousand slices for landlords, right? This is not going to be one moment in time where there's this economic cliff like the tech wreck of 2000 or the 07 mortgage crisis. This is going to be just a long, long bleed as corporate America remains healthy and able to pay their rent, but is going to pay less rent on less space when those leases expire. And so that's what we're in the middle of right now. We're in the middle of this kind of bleeding out process. And I, and I want to kind of share some data around this that really speaks to where we are. Um, and Edward, just making sure you can see that with no problem. Yep, what's happening in, really happening oh, in the commercial real estate. Lovely, technology's working. So here's, um, let me get to slide number two. Why isn't it uh, moving forward? Excuse me just a second here, Edward. I don't know why the slide isn't advancing. Um, there we go. Uh, hold on. Okay. So um, here's what's going on. The reality is it's starting to level off. It's still getting worse, but it's getting worse more slowly. So if you kind of look at the data here, you look at what's happening in San Francisco, for example, and this is, this is January of this year, now year to date. So the blue line is January. The red lines year to date. And you might remember in past presentations, we were talking about pre-COVID to today. Well, we don't need to talk about that anymore. We Everybody knows it's worse, right? But is it getting worse? And what we're seeing is some of these markets are starting to flatten out, right? And they're, they're kind of obvious, Orange County, LA, but some are still getting incrementally worse, a percent or two year to date worse. San Jose, Seattle, San Francisco. Now realize 
San Francisco availability rate pre-COVID was four or five percent. Okay, it's now 33 percent. You know, imagine you drove home tonight and in your neighborhood, a third of the homes had for sale signs in front of them. Like, just put your head around that. That's what's happening in San Francisco. And now you got to understand that this data is availability rate data. So this is all space for lease or sublease. This isn't vacancy. This is availability. Vacancy always understates how bad the market is. Because if you were going to go look to buy homes with your spouse, you wouldn't say, show me the vacant homes for sale. You'd say, show me all the homes for sale. Well, the same in commercial real estate. The brokerage community and landlords have sort of rigged the data against tenants okay by talking about vacancy we don't care what's vacant we want to know what's on the market for lease or sublease and so all these markets now are screaming to 20 or 25 percent around the country and what's going to happen though is it's going to get incrementally worse over the next three or four years as the other 60 percent of the office leases around the united states continue to expire so in the meantime Here's what corporate America is doing. Corporate America is taking these liabilities that have another two to five years left on them and they're dumping the space if they can. So if they're a two floor tenant and they want to get out of one floor, they've got a floor on the space for market. Or if they've got 20,000 square feet and they only need five, well, they got the 15 on the market or maybe the whole thing on the market to sublease it and downsize. But basically what's going on, and this started during COVID and is continuing to get worse, it's not stopping, is you've got this spike in sublease space that is literally unprecedented. You know, we have two and a half times the amount of sublease space on the market today than we've ever had in history. And it doesn't seem to be stopping. And here's what's really crazy about this data, Edward, is that every day, one of these subleases gets taken off the market, either the, the lease, the master lease expires, and so the sublease is terminating, or, um, you know, it gets subleased, right? Because a lot of these subleases can be had at 20, 30, 40 dis discounts to market. Like in San Francisco, landlords are still colluding, working as a group supported by the brokerage community with these crazy asking rents of 80, 90, 100 bucks a foot. They do rent per square foot per year there. Meanwhile, subleases can be had in the same building for 40 or $50 a foot. Okay, so, so literally half off in San Francisco. Less so here in San Diego, where you see discounts more commonly of 20, 30%. But if someone gets under a year or two of remaining term, sometimes 40% off, 50% off. So these subleases are kind of where the action is right now. And they come furnished, plug and play. Um, in, in, you know, they're available sort of on demand. You can move in next month. And that's where the deals are. And so this has really become a problem for landlords because this is part of the availability data and it's dragging the market down because corporate America is just dumping this stuff on the market with really no end in sight, particularly until they start bleeding off these remaining lease expirations over the next two, three years. I, I think this sublease overhang is going to persist for the foreseeable future and continue to be just a significant drag on the office sector. Um, and here's some here's some other data that will take us back to kind of pre-COVID to today. This put sublease space in a different lens. You know, in, even in a healthy market, there's some amount of sublease space on the market. But basically around the country, you see double in most cases or triple the amount of sublease space today as shown in the red line than the blue line showing pre-COVID. So, so every metro area has some amount of distress. San Diego, Orange County, much less. But these big metro areas, you know, L.A., San Francisco, as you can see, Boston, New York, these markets are really suffering right now. So it's 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 bad news for landlords in these markets right now. Really, really tough. Um, let's let's pivot to industrial now. Um, here's what's interesting about industrial. A year or two, this was sort of the safe harbor, right? Everything was going great. The supply chain was filling up. Availability rates were down in the low single digits. And I wanted to measure year to date, where are we from January? Well, actually, I'm sorry, last year, January, 2022 to today. Um, what's happening is things are changing. Availability rates are clipping up a percent or two, or in the case of New York, almost doubling in the last year and three quarters. So, so things are shifting around in the country right now with industrial and what, isn't really considered here 
is that there's about 570 million square feet of industrial space under construction around the country, all not leased. Okay, so this big spike in demand by the, the Target.coms and the Walmart.coms and the Amazons and all these you know, e-commerce fulfillment guys during COVID in 2021, basically the landlord community wanted to accommodate that surge in demand and thought it would keep going forever. And so they launched all these new industrial buildings and projects that are now completing in the next 18 months and, and demand has gone flat. So with that increasing supply coming along and with its own surge in sublease space, because what's happening is all these e-commerce and industrial companies are now rationalizing their own national portfolios. So there is an unprecedented in the last 13 years amount of sublease space in the market. In fact, if you just look at the last you know, year and a half since the beginning of 2022, we've had a doubling in one year of the amount of sublease space on the market. So the industrial sector is definitely getting rattled a little bit with this excess supply now bouncing onto the market that is going to start becoming disruptive to landlords, right? Landlords have no pricing power when the market starts getting flooded with new construction or flooded in this case with sublease inventory. So for industrial tenants around the country, this is really welcome news because we saw rents in Southern California, you know, go from, uh, you know, warehouse space pre-COVID in San Diego was leasing for 95 cents, you know, in Sereno and Miramar and Poway, industrial space today is a buck 85. You know, out in the Inland Empire, space pre-COVID was 65 cents a foot, and it almost tripled. I mean, literally deals were going down in the last year at a buck 85, a buck 95 in warehouse buildings in the Inland Empire. And so all of this is getting reconciled right now and landlords and brokers sort of are trying to kind of hold the floor on pricing. You haven't really seen asking rents decline, but the reality is space is starting to lag on the market. We're starting to see more free rent and we're starting to see some landlords break ranks on their pricing. Um, here's kind of drilling in by submarket. I thought this was useful, particularly being in Southern California. This is pre-COVID sublease space in January 2020 to where we are now year to date. And you can see, interestingly, the Inland Empire is getting hit the hardest. The Inland Empire is where the overwhelming concentration of this sublease space is in terms of the most, having the most available, but also percentage-wise, you know, being more, you know, more than a doubling. Certainly other markets like Boston, Atlanta are spiking as well. But a lot of the sublease inventory is concentrated in the Inland Empire, less of it here in San Diego. So it, it why, this why is. Would that be, why would that be, David? What's happening? Well, here's, here's what happened, right? So COVID happens. Consumers go online and start buying everything. And in about three or four months, e commerce companies start fighting over inventory of space in Southern California. I remember doing a survey back in 2021 for buildings over 200 industrial buildings over 200,000 square feet in Orange County and Los Angeles County and there were nine of them literally only nine buildings available for distributors over 200,000 square feet in Orange County and Los Angeles County combined so we saw record shortages of big distribution space for e-commerce and fulfillment and 3PL companies there there are literally bidding wars happening between these behemoth companies like Amazon where they'd come in and say okay, we'll sign a 12-year lease instead of a 10-year lease and beat DHL out of a building. I mean, it's just it was just madness, okay? And so the, it got completely frothy going into 2021 and even lagging into 2022. And so everybody overcommitted in Southern California to too much warehouse space. And so now that consumers are into some kind of new normal, you know, not that they're not still online buying a bunch of stuff, but people are back to work and the consumer economy shifting. And, you know, we all know what's happening, right? People are doing other things now. Um, the warehouses have kind of started to empty out a little bit. And these big companies are finding themselves with too much space. And so they're dumping these buildings. And Amazon also has pivoted towards more of a real estate ownership strategy in the last two years. And so in some cases, they're dumping leased real estate to move into owned real estate. Well, so why, you, why are they shifting, shifting from lease to owned? 
really kind of a cost of capital. We, you know, when lease rates became a buck 85 and they're getting forced into signing 10 and 12 year buildings, you, you, your 12 year, uh, 10, 12 year leases for buildings, you might as well just own it. You know, so that's, so that's what's happened is you see uh, an Amazon react by saying, hey, we're not going to be bullied by landlords anymore. We're not going to be held hostage to these supply shortages. We, we want to control our destiny. And also Amazon has changed the nature of how they build their distribution buildings. They don't use traditional warehouses uh, for their main distribution centers. They build these multi-story automated facilities that do all the picking with robots. And so the characteristics of the building type that Amazon has evolved into doesn't look like a traditional warehouse anymore. So they're dumping out of a lot of this stuff. Um, let's drill into San Diego County. So I, I still think it's useful to talk about pre-COVID to present as it relates to San Diego. Um, the blue line here represents pre-COVID, the red line is today. And, and you can see every market is up and to the right, except Serena Mesa and Serena Valley. The explanation for that is the life science sector got superheated during COVID. And in 2020, there was no more wet lab space for research. And so developers went and started buying office buildings to either convert to lab or buying office and lab buildings to tear or uh, office and flex industrial buildings to tear them down to turn them into six story laboratory facilities. So, so what happened in Serena Mesa is literally half of the office inventory got taken off the market and either torn down or converted to lab space. So, so what you have here is a denominator change that basically caused the percentage of availability to remain relatively flat. Had that not happened, literally Serena Mesa and Serena Valley today would be arguably 30% available, maybe higher. Okay, but the lab sector sort of took that inventory off and it's it's gone, you know, arguably permanently. Um, but things are now getting soft in Serena now because there's just not a lot of velocity of office demand there. But you see that you know, we're looking generally at, you know, UTC Kearney in the 16, 17% range, Carlsbad, Del Mar Heights, Mission Valley, all 20s and growing and downtown, you know, screaming towards 40%. And a lot of this downtown story is a result of the old Horton Plaza project, you know, which was going to be a conversion to office space. And then when office demand went away during COVID, the developer has basically pivoted to a life science strategy and you have IQHQ, the 1.7 million square foot life science project out on the waterfront, also kind of dragging the numbers down. So you've got this bloat in downtown and notwithstanding a lot of office tenants downtown have gone remote and professional services companies have moved out and downsized. So uh, downtown is suffering greatly uh, one of the highest availability rates in the country. And we're also seeing this generally in downtowns around the country. Like if you went to downtown LA today, the availability rate's 30%. Well, it's 30% in downtown Seattle and Denver. All of the downtown markets around the country are suffering right now relative to the suburbs. And so those metro area numbers that I showed you early, where everybody's kind of up in the in the 20s to 25% range, the downtowns in all those metro areas are a lot worse. The high rises are suffering a lot worse than the suburbs are. And, and part of that story is about the hybrid and remote working, right? People don't wanna be driving for an hour to work anymore. Um, there are all kinds of estimates that are out lately that uh, the commuting cost per employee that has to drive downtown and pay to park and the wear and tear on their car and the extra cost of meals and all their other expenses are as high as $10,000 a year. You know, so, so the reality is expen it's expensive to commute full time. And a lot of people have woken up to this. It's all over the papers. <laughs> and so um, companies that are in the suburbs find themselves closer to their labor pools and are generally having more success at getting more people in and more frequently. So downtown what, ha what happens to downtown offices because you can't convert I'll tell, I'll tell you it's it's grim edward um you know because most of these buildings cannot be converted to residential 
because the floor plates are the wrong size or the wrong configuration. There are um, basically every municipality around, around the United States requires that you have every bedroom has to have a window and sometimes an operable window. And so these buildings were not built with that uh, foot, the floor plate size being small enough where you can configure 600 to 1500 square foot residential units that would have the living space and all the bedrooms on the window line. It just, the geometry doesn't work. And so, you know, the estimates are that only at three to 5% of all office space in the United States has the potential for conversion to residential because of these floor plate and dimension limitations that I just described. So um, I think what you're gonna see, and it's already started happening, is you're gonna see the biggest wave of foreclosures we've seen since the early 90s. And you know there, there's a few buildings right now in downtown San Diego that are on the verge of foreclosure. It's starting to happen in Orange County, but downtown LA, downtown Denver, San Francisco, you, know, you can go back to March of this year and probably find a hundred articles written about office building foreclosures around the country. But JLL, one of the three landlord uh, you know, brokerage firms in the world uh, has, is rumored that they're saying that their most profitable division next year is going to be their um, foreclosures division. So the group that takes that that you know for, works for lenders and, and investors or pension funds when they go through foreclosure that takes over the receiverships. It's their receivership group. Now, granted, their their tenant rep sector's been uh, division's been slaughtered. Their landlord listing group is getting slaughtered. But the, everybody's talking about how much money is going to be made in the next three years in their receivership groups. So, um, you know, there's there's dominoes out there just starting to fall. And part and part of this is there's billions and billions of dollars of uh, loans that basically come due over the next three years in the commercial real estate asset class. But many developers and owners right now are in violation of their loan to value covenants. And so these lenders require the developers to have a certain loan to value relationship and if values go down, the borrower, the owner of the building has to write a check to the lender to basically buy the loan down to de-risk the loan. And so there's a bunch of capital calls happening around the country right now where lenders are calling the landlord and saying, hey, you need to send us a check for $10 million, $40 million, $80 million. And in lieu, they're getting the keys. Okay, that's that's what's happening right now. So, and, and this is going to go on as the commercial real estate market continues to become worse and worse and worse on the margin for the next three to four years. Um, this bloodletting is is going to happen. This, this, these landlords are uh, irrecoverable in the damage that's occurring to their portfolio and are completely impaired on a lot of these assets. And, and they're coming back. I mean, it's just, it's just what's going to happen. Uh, and they can't stop it. I mean, you know, tenants continue to get smaller. Negative absorption continues to happen every quarter, every year for another three to five years. And it just ends really, really badly for a lot of these folks. I, mean, I get that, you know, you're going to be able to buy these things cheaply, but, uh, you know, what are you going to do with them once you've got them? If there's well, well, that's that's happen? the problem, Edward, is, you know, how cheap, <laughs> how much devalue, how much devaluation has to happen to where it makes sense to actually buy one of these things, right? Because it is the old proverbial catching a falling knife. Yeah. We don't know what this stuff is worth today. And it's very, very risky. But but what's going to happen, I think, very much what happened in the early mid 90s is these buildings are going to lose 60 to 80 percent of their value. Somebody is going to buy these things at a huge discount to replacement cost, and they're going to drop the rents. Okay, so if in San Francisco landlords are trying to charge 80 bucks and subleases are going for 40 to 50, well, somebody's going to come in and buy these properties for 10 cents, 20 cents on the dollar, and they're going to reprice market. They're going to come back with a new marketing campaign that says, hey, move over here. We're only charging 30 bucks. And, and when that happens, it's the beginning of the end. And that's what happened in the early to mid 90s, because it's inevitable that the whole thing, the whole house of cards collapses at that point in time when these things get devalued and some entrepreneur 
landlord developer reprices the new market and isn't playing the old game and price supporting you know their brethren landlords the whole thing crumbles and i think that's where it's going if you know when when we do this update 3 years from now i think that's what will have happened is is all of the gas is coming out of the the market all of these asking rents that are ridiculous that we still see around town with landlords and their brokers trying to prop up the market all that nonsense is going to be over and we're going to find out where the real reality of these markets are and it's and it's going to be uh, a painful process getting there but and here's here's why it doesn't happen overnight right like if you think about uh you know the stock market and you've got volatility right um you know because you've got this global trading platform right and buyers and sellers every second well in commercial real estate it's the exact adverse it's it's the most illiquid asset class you could imagine and what you have are these long term macroeconomic cycles where they they get bid up and then they they get bid down where we're in you know year 3 of the bid down but with 3 to 4 maybe 5 more years to go so the bottom is way out there right like along the way it's going to get worse and worse and worse but we're not hitting bottom on this thing for 3 to 5 years i mean it's going to take a while and I think that's what's hard for people to get their head around. Why hasn't it changed faster? Well, until thousands and thousands of leases expire and the other 60% of the market rolls over, we're not getting there. But when, when that happens, we will be at the bottom. Um, here's, here's kind of a snapshot though of San Diego. You know, I talked about nationally this 265 million square feet. Um, there's still a bunch of sublease space in San Diego County for office space. And I'm frequently getting engaged by clients where I say, hey, let's go look at the subleases first. We want to do a two or three year deal, 20, 30% below market. I mean, I'm doing sublease deals in UTC right now at 250, full service gross, including all the utilities, all the furniture, all the electronics and audiovisual and everything thrown in, whiteboards, you name it, you know, move in tomorrow kind of thing with at least a month per year free and sometimes more. Okay, and, and I'm talking about in, in the, the good buildings around the UTC mall. So, you know, there are great values out there right now. And as you see, it's going up and to the right, right? Where, where does this end uh, incrementally? You know, next year, we're probably going to see more subway space come on the market in San Diego County. So, uh, you know, if you're a tenant, again, this is all good news for you, right? Your cost structure is coming down. Um, Here's David, 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 we got a question. What, what does this do to regional banks along the way? Well, it's a great point, right? Like, so I'm not a banking expert, but if I were, I'd be looking into what percent of the assets are on these banks that relate to commercial real estate office loans. And I would devalue that by 50%. And so um, my understanding though, is that the bulk of the debt for office space is actually owned by regional banks around the United States. And so I think you're going to see a storm coming here, right? You're gonna see this affect some banks. For example, there's this bank that we are now kind of laughing about called Bank of the Ozarks. And I guess they just went on the watch list a couple of weeks ago, but they made a bunch of these loans in the office sector and in the life science sector, which I'm gonna talk about here in a minute. And those loans are toxic loans. They're, they're not going to end well for these guys. And so um, we do believe that you will see some, some consequences to the regional banking community across the country as a result of these foreclosures and all of this distress. It's, it's gonna end badly. Um, here's just a snapshot of San Diego Industrial. So kind of a mixed story. Again, this is kind of going back to pre-COVID to the red line today. So you've got an uptick in the South Bay and Otai where there's a lot of new construction that's come on to support a lot of the cross-border activities and the nearshoring. But industrial generally is held up pretty well. I mean, anytime you see availability rates below 10%, it's still a landlord's market. So, you know, in places like Miramar and Kearney Mesa, there's been a little bit of an uptick, but these markets are still relatively tight, particularly if you're a big distribution company. I just Literally this went this week went out with uh, one of my clients, a company called BioLegend here in town that makes reagents and they have a warehouse requirement for their finished goods and raw materials. And you know, there's only five buildings to look at and only two really work well. 
you know, so the market for good space is still pretty tight out there, particularly in the central county area for distribution companies. Now let's let's talk about biotech. So I I always say that the amount of sublease space becomes the leading edge of what's coming. Okay. So so back in April, we ran a report that we published on all the lab space sublease inventory. So this is not office space. This is lab with some office space attached to it. And, and we just literally are publishing the update to this today, right? So this is like fresh off the press. So today, I'm going to blow this up. There are 35 wet lab subleases around the central county area, making up almost 800,000 square feet of space. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time kind of going one-on-one -on -one through these things, but basically here's, here's the punchline. Starting March of last year, the life science sector in the capital markets started melting down and everyone's value started going in the tank. And companies have been unable for, for the most part, with some exceptions, obviously, to raise fresh capital. And so what you have is an asset class uh, in the public markets that's in free fall. There, there's you know, hundreds of life science companies right now that are trading below cash. Uh, many, many life science companies have lost 90 to 95% of their value and are trading sub 100 million, sub 50 million in market cap. And it's unlikely that a lot of those will get funded. But guess what? A lot of those folks signed some big leases back in 2021 and 2022. And now, as they try to downsize their, their cost structure and their burn rate, all this excess space is getting dumped on the market for sublease. And I'm just going to kind of flip through this. So, uh, the X means that one went away since our April report. The others either are still stagnating and the yellow are new. And so here's Torrey Pines, a bunch of subly space. Here's Serena Valley. Here's Serena Mesa. You know, it's, it's crickets, right? Nothing's coming off the market and only more and more space is coming on the market. As you can see, the market in Sorrento is getting flooded with new sublease space. And here's UTC. A couple coming on the market, coming off the market. People like to be in UTC. Now, I realize a couple of these spaces have come off the market because the tenant defaulted. <laughs> and, and basically, the space came off the market, and now it's, it's back in the landlord's hands trying to find a tenant. But this is ugly, right? You know, the old picture is worth a thousand words. Well, here's the picture, you know. There's all this wet lab space, 35 of them sitting around on the market today uh, with no demand. And so, um, and, 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 it, and it gets even worse than this, okay? Because there's about 5 million square feet on the market under construction right now, okay? So if you were to go drive around Serena Mesa today, you're gonna see a bunch of steel coming out of the ground about every two or three blocks, okay? Go up to Torrey Pines. Go to UTC. I mean, all of the, or in this 1.7 million square feet that just got finished out on the Bayfront, IQHQ, that nobody's interested in, right? So you've got 5 million square feet of new construction, almost 800,000 square feet of sublease space, all priced at 20, 30% below what landlords will do. And you've got Sereno Therapeutics in bankruptcy that's basically rejecting leases on half a million square feet of lab space, okay? That's happening in real time. And guess what? There's a bunch more bad news to come in the sector as companies that are public can't get funding or companies that are private even have less support and won't get funding from investors. There's probably going to be 20 or 30 life science companies between now and the end of next year default on their leases. Okay, so that we can't even really quantify yet. But there's a whole bunch of space coming back because of this tragic situation of what's happening in the capital markets where life science companies aren't fundable today and they aren't able to access the capital markets unless you have the best of teams with the best of science and the best of progress. And even then, you know, valuations are tough. So, Edward, it's, it's really, really grim in the life science sector because it is lining up for a perfect storm between the new construction, the sublease space, the space coming back through bankruptcy, the space coming back through defaults, and the fact that some of these spaces aren't even the market yet, like BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb's going to move into their new campus in 2025. 
well, they're going to dump a couple hundred thousand square feet more on the market. So there's some hidden inventory that's not on the market yet, but that we all know is coming back in 2024 and 2025 when the shell game kind of gets moved around a little bit in Torrey Pines and Serena Mason and the Campus Point area. So um, all of this, I think, means that we've probably got seven to 10 years of capacity coming on the market in the next 24 months. And meanwhile, demand will be anemic for another two to three years. So um, sadly, you know, this, this life science asset class that was so robust during COVID through 2022 is also now unwinding much because it got overbuilt, right? Because what happened is a lot of me too players came into the San Diego market since office was down, all this capital during COVID was still on the sidelines wanting to invest in commercial real estate. You know, you got these pension fund managers and all these investors with all these billions of dollars and they've got their asset allocation models. And it's like, hey, we got to invest 10% in real estate. Office is out. Well, God, life science seems hot. Let's do that. And so billions have gotten poured into the markets here in the region for new construction. And now demands have evaporated. And it isn't coming back. Okay. And the problem's even worse, like in a Boston, there's 12 million square feet of lab space under construction in the Boston metro area with, with no demand. So this is now a national problem in the life science sector. The story is the same in Seattle and South San Francisco. It's really going to be rough on these landlords. You know, again, if you're a, a, a biotech CFO listening to this, there's some good days coming your way. I mean, there's going to be some there's already some great values today, but it's only going to get better incrementally in 2024, 2025, and thereafter, as this thing all kind of plays out. I mean, normally in economics, you've got supply and demand, and you, it adjusts to a market clearing price. But what I'm hearing you saying, there is no demand. So what happens? These things just sit vacant? Yeah. So, so what happens is you start seeing um, some desperate deals on the way down, right? So uh, big landlords that have the staying power, like in Alexandria, that is, you know, probably the premier landlord, those guys get cannibalistic. <laughs> they just start eating the competition, right? And so they'll do anything to keep a tenant or get a tenant. So all of a sudden, six months free, a year free, uh, $250 in TIs, $300 in TIs, we'll pay for your furniture. You know, so on the way down, the concessions blow up before the rents collapse, right? And then eventually the rents collapse, right? And, and you know, if you're a big public REIT and you don't have a lot of debt on the asset, you can still, you know, you, you won't generate the returns, okay? But you're, you're gearing towards occupancy. You're putting, putting people in seats at that point, right? But the folks that have these buildings under construction with a lender are completely upside down. I mean, it's going to be just game over for those folks. So, you know, we'll see if the Trammell Crows of the world and the Harrison Streets and all these other guys that are new to the market really um, can withstand this storm. You know, the incumbents, the Longfellows, the Alexandrias, the Health Peaks that have been in the market longer, that have more favorable basis in the real estate, uh, that have more diversity in tenant base, you know, they're going to be fine. There's an article, Edward, last week that just came out. Alexandria stopped construction in Seattle on a new project, literally. The steel's going up, and they literally put a fence around it and locked it up last week. Yeah. Okay. So, so people, <laughs> you know, at what point do you just put the brakes on and say, "Hey, let's just shut the site down. We're not going to spend another two hundred million dollars to finish it. Let's just shut the site down, mothball this thing, and live to fight another day." So, um, it, it there's some there's some really bad stuff happening, kind of in real time around the life science sector on the commercial real estate side nationally and, and that you know we're certainly going to see here locally um i got a couple of questions coming in so um one's about the impact of the commercial marketplace on the residential housing marketplace i think a year ago when we were talking apple was you know bringing a lot of people in amazon was bringing a lot of people in you were still relatively bullish on that residential marketplace because you know we were attracting some great companies and great people here i read recently that apple basically waved their hands on trying to you know take over the mobile uh, the modem uh, chips you know and they're going to stick with qualcomm for longer etc so are we seeing some of these companies not bring people in now? And is that's going to kind of have a negative impact both on the commercial side and on the, and the residential? 
Yeah, so you brought up a good point, right? It's all these asset classes are a function of supply and demand. So is is this lack of demand in the commercial side going to bleed over into a lack of demand on the residential side? I don't think so. I think these are pretty decoupled events. Um, the reality is that employment is still strong in San Diego, and a lot of those people are employed working at home. And so uh, there's still strong demand for housing. Um, prices still seem to be going up, even though in, even though uh, you know interest rates are going up. There's conversation that if and when interest rates go down, there'll be even more of a feeding frenzy for housing. We'll see, right? Um, you know, but I don't I don't feel like there's any bleed over into the residential real estate asset class that we that I foresee that's as a result of everything I'm describing here. Okay. And um, what about the is uh, and you are obviously a lot closer to I am. Is Apple still bringing? You know, they. I think you said it was like one million square feet or something crazy. The size of the campus they built. Yeah. So well, they bought the old HP campus up in Rancho Bernardo of roughly sixty-seven acres, and you know that is where their greenfield future development is going to be. Um, but they still have about a million square feet of space in UTC, primarily on Town Center Drive, but also on Eastgate Mall. And, and what's what's really hard about it is Apple likes to be under the radar. They don't want anybody to know what they're doing and they don't even put signs on their buildings. And so, you know, if you were to drive up these streets, you know, Eastgate Mall, Town Center Drive, you look around and you're like, where's Apple? Okay, well, if I were in your passenger seat, I would say they're there, they're there, they're there, right? They're in, they're in about eight or nine buildings up there, um, including taking over Cooley's old building you know, on Eastgate when Cooley moved to uh, Torrey Pines, when I moved them up there, I represented them in, uh, you know, this wonderful new facility up there with the life science community that's their core client base. And then Apple came along and leased their building before they even moved out. So um, yeah, Apple's got, it still has a big footprint here. But are they are they bringing the? I mean, maybe you're telling me you don't know because they're not they're not communicating. But are they are they putting people in it or a lot of empty space at the moment? My my understanding is they're putting people in it, and and part of what appears to be happening is you know if you're willing and wanting to live in California and pay the tax burden that we have here, there's a lot of people that want to live in San Diego County and not Silicon Valley. You know, people want to get out of San Jose and Santa Clara and what it means to live there and the traffic and the grind. And um, a lot of people would prefer to be in San Diego. So my understanding is there's still folks shifting from Northern Cal to Southern Cal. Okay. All right. We got a, another question. People, please keep sending the questions in. Any sense how local city governments grapple with reduced tax revenues due to lower lab and office activity? Yeah, it's, it's going to become um, a big problem at the state level and, and certainly trickle down to the city level because when these buildings get sold at huge discounts, they're, they're going to, the tax base is going to get repriced, right? Some building that you know sold at half a billion dollars um, five years ago and that sells at 100 million or 50 million, well, guess what? That becomes a new tax base. Okay, so and then what happens is, okay, by the way, rewind to the early 90s, there's a whole little cottage industry of tax consultants out there. And what these tax consultants do is they come along and they say, oh, my gosh, you know, look what just happened down the street. The building's worth $100 million. Hey, Mr. Landlord, your building needs to get revalued as well. We need to go in and fight for a temporary reduction on your taxes as well, because your building value is down, too. And, and the state has to deal with those people. If those claims are legitimate, they have to do a temporary tax reduction on those buildings. So as values start collapsing, even the folks that are performing are going to start making claims for tax reductions, okay? Although they're temporary, but they, they last for years, okay? And so we're going to start seeing a major, in fact, Adam Schiff, who I know, um, you know, he and I had a conversation about a year ago regarding this exact problem. I said, Adam, you got to be prepared in your, your budgets that this is coming your way. This devaluation of this asset class is going to lose 20, 30, 40 percent of the value. Your tax base is going to get just sliced away over the next three to five years. Uh, and, and the punchline, Edward, is there is no plan, right? There is no offsetting cost 
uh, adjustment that state government or city government can make for this problem, right? I'm not even sure they've quantified the problem, but it's a big looming problem. Some cities, unlike San Diego, some cities actually have a rent tax. Like in San Francisco, if you're a tenant, you actually get taxed on your rent, okay? So the city of San Francisco has an even bigger problem because not only are they gonna be affected by this state of California wide issue, but the rents that aren't gonna be there for them to tax anymore, right? The rents are either going to zero because the availability of vacancy is gonna go so high, or rents are going to be less with tenants paying less rent on less square footage. And so you have municipalities that thought it was a good idea to tax rent, tax rents that are going to have major, major budget gaps. Any, uh, any bright spots anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's grim, right? Like, but this is my fourth rodeo, you know, as I started out at the beginning, I've been doing this a long time. I've been through a lot of cycles, right? The good news, you know, we represent tenants. So all of you on the call are either clients or prospective clients for me, right? right? The good news is that as you muscle your way through your through this economy, right? You're you're going to pay less rent, right? Whether it's lab space, industrial space, manufacturing space, office space, rents are down and coming down more. And so, you know, I think for business owners, you know, this is the backside of the cycle. I mean, pre-COVID, if you were leasing office space in San Diego, you know, you were paying up, right? Well, now it's changing for you. You know, or if you were two years ago paying exorbitant warehouse or lab rents, two years from now, we're going to be talking about a whole different reality. So I think, you know, Edward, and I'm client facing, you know, I, I'm still out there doing tours and, and doing the negotiations. I mean, I'm, I'm tip of the spear for our company. I'm 100% client facing. And so, you know, I'm, I'm living this every day and it would be easy to be bummed out about it, but I'm actually having a really good time. And I think it's because I don't own buildings and I don't represent landlords, right? So I'm out there putting points on the board for tenants, helping them get great deals and great results. And that that's what drives my excitement and my fulfillment. So, so for me, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of bad news here, but it depends who you are, right? right? <laughs> a lot of bad news for landlords, investors, regional banks, right? This is all what's coming, you know, public REIT stocks. I mean, this whole asset class is 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 in the process of getting slaughtered right now. Yeah. But for us business owners and you as a CEO, yeah. great great times are ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, you'll be able to pick up some fantastic locations uh, at uh, at great prices. So right. Awesome. Well, we are right on time. So David, is, as always, thank you for your insight. And yeah, we'll uh, schedule another one here from now and uh, see what has changed because it's uh, obviously a pretty dynamic market. So uh, uh, this recording is going to be, uh, well, this, this webinar is recorded. So we'll send out the link to people. So if you had a friend or something that missed it, you know, feel free to obviously watch it. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us today. And David, thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing uh, uh, members and guests at the uh, upcoming uh, HBS pr Professor Meg Rithmeyer. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Edward. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.